Hello, thanks for watching. Just a small message for you before we start. This video was a huge undertaking and the longest floor video I've made so far. Considering the insane amount of time I spent on research, artwork, editing and animation, this project is really only made possible by the consistent donations I get from my amazing supporters. So if you like the project, you can consider becoming a patron yourself and this will give you a few perks, but you can also become a member on YouTube or support me on Ko-Fi. Whatever suits you the best. Links to ways to support me are in the description below. Thanks for listening, now let's get on with the video. Horus woke up and opened his eyes. He found himself alone under a bright blue sky in a pleasant and endless green meadow. He didn't know where he was. It obviously wasn't the medical deck or any other place on his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, nor was it a world he recognized. He didn't remember how he got there. He couldn't recall much of what had happened on the moon of Devon after his fight with Eugene Temba. But after pondering for a while, he realized that he had most likely died from the wound in his arm. The strange and peaceful place where he found himself now must surely be what the afterlife looks like. But he wouldn't be able to appreciate the blissful surroundings for long. Out of nowhere, the world around him started twisting. His mind was assaulted by all kinds of visions. Before his very eyes passed a mirage of wars he had fought throughout his life. These were followed by gruesome hallucinations of decay, burned cities and shattered planets. Strange memories from humanity's history and glimpses of the future etched themselves into his brain. These disturbing and uncontrollable visions unsettled Horus, but he was powerless to stop them. Then he heard a loud howling that instantly snapped him out of his visions. A large pack of wolves with baring teeth had arrived and started surrounding him. As they came closer, the leading wolf spoke and asked his name. Despite his fear, he responded by loudly proclaiming his name, Horus Lupercal. But the wolf asked again, and again, and again. But every time Horus answered, the growling pack circled in closer. He wasn't sure if the wolves were real or just an illusion. He thought he had recognized a faint glimmer of his brother Primarch Magnus in the voice and appearance of the wolf. But that wouldn't be possible, since Magnus was back on Prospero, prohibited from using his magic after psychic experimentation was banned during the Council of Nikea. If this was the afterlife, then surely it must be hell. The confused Horus could take no more, and he started running to escape from the feral animals. The wolves chased him for what seemed like an eternity, until he had lost all sense of time and direction. By now, the day had turned to night, lit by a bright moon. He arrived at a deep water filled crater, and in his panicked escape from the wolves, hurled himself into the void where darkness once again enveloped him. Meanwhile, inside the Temple of the Serpent Lodge, the Davonite shamans were going through the rituals of their dark magic to keep the dying Horus trapped inside the warp. Erebus was there and ready to perform the final act of his treachery. The plan was for him to enter the warp in order to manipulate Horus into betraying his oath to the Emperor. Within the warp, his true identity could be concealed. To Horus, he would appear like the beloved Lunar Wolves Captain Hastas Ejanus, who had been killed during the diplomatic delegation on System 63-19. Over his lifetime, Erebus had developed more knowledge about the forces of chaos than any other, but he was still unfamiliar with many of its mysteries. How he was supposed to enter the warp, he did not completely understand yet, but he trusted that the Davonite shamans who served the Dark Gods would guide him. Without him realizing it, one of the sorcerers had snuck up on Erebus. Before he knew what was happening, they had slit his throat with a knife. Erebus's dying body sprawled on the ground in the pool of his own blood. It had been the final requirement to conclude the ritual. Horus woke up yet again on the same wonderfully blissful green meadow as where he had come to consciousness before, but this time he was fully armored in his old white Lunar Wolves plate. The lengthy escape had made him thirsty, so he made his way towards a nearby river for a drink. 
To his surprise, he witnessed an Astartes warrior floating face down in the water. He rushed towards the soldier and dragged him onto shore where he quickly turned the body over to see if the man was still alive. The blood sacrifice had worked. Erebus had entered the warp disguised as Captain Hustus Sejanus. Although Horus was by now aware that little in this realm of illusion could be trusted, he was delighted to at least see his old comrade. Even if he wasn't real, the appearance of his beloved captain brought him comfort. Guided by the false Sejanus, together they went on an odyssey through the warp, where Horus was granted more visions of the future and the past that could be both true or false. He was shown the creation and loss of the Primarchs, including his own birth. He was told about how the Emperor had bargained with the Gods of Chaos in order to gain power to create his chosen sons, and about his secret aspirations to become a god himself too. The journey was of course carefully orchestrated to exploit Horus's confusion and insecurities, where once he believed firmly in the Imperial Truth, it all seemed like lies to him. The Emperor's treachery against humanity and the Primarch seemed so obvious now, but the manipulative visions didn't stop there. They continued to feed his ambitions, his resentment, and his anger. The Gods of Chaos promised him immeasurable power, and in return, all he would have to do was stop the Emperor from carrying out his ascension to Godhood. But if Horus refused to accept this duty, they would let his body die and he would be lost in the nightmares of the warp forever. It was then that the wolf pack arrived again. The leading wolf transformed into Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion. Dark spells had managed to keep him from interfering, and so it took a long time for him to catch up with Horus. But Magnus was a powerful psyker, and so he finally managed to break through the spells and reveal himself in order to warn his brother. He didn't have much time though. Every second he was there cost the lives of dozens of his psychic servants to help him keep the connection into the warp open. The first thing he did was tear off Erebus's disguise, who now no longer looked like Sejanus, but stood in his own wordbearer's armor. Although Magnus was loyal to the Emperor and had come to help, his unsanctioned and illegal use of sorcery was suspicious and revolting. Both of these men had initially come to Horus in disguise, one in the form of a wolf, the other as his former captain. And in the deceptive warp, neither could really be trusted. He was sick of the deception, and his anger at the whole ordeal made him re regain his resolve. He was the war master after all, and he would not allow these two swindlers to send him on a wild goose chase through the warp again. He interrupted their argument and ordered them to be silent. Horus Lupercal had made his choice. Abaddon, Aximond, and many other sons of Horus had been standing sigil near the Serpent Temple entrance ever since the wounded War Master had been brought inside to make sure no one would try and interrupt the healing ceremony. A large crowd had joined them, made up of the Vengeful Spirit's ordinary human crew members who had set up camp outside, desperately waiting for their revered War Master's return. It had been nine days since the temple had been shut, and now the time for waiting was finally over. Either the War Master would live, or he had perished. Loken and his companions arrived too. All of the Astartes had their weapons ready and loaded in case there was any trouble. Nobody knew what to expect. The fate of their beloved Legion hanged in the balance, and only the return of their Primarch could set things right once again. But whatever disagreements the members of the Mournival still had, at this moment they set their differences aside and together they anticipated the opening of the gates. The huge doors made a loud crack as they slowly began to open. Out of the Serpent Temple strode the War Master in his magnificent power armor. He carried his sword high above his head to symbolize the wound in his arm had completely healed. Although a Primarch was always an astonishing sight to behold, Horus looked more vitalized than ever before. The crowd burst out in a roar of elation and triumph. With a near deafening volume, the crowd chanted, Lupercal, Lupercal. The War Master had survived. The Legion had been saved. The 63rd Expeditionary Fleet soon recovered its personnel from the moon's surface. With the War Master in good health, there was no reason to waste any more time. A new Imperial Commander was assigned to replace Eugene Temba and enforce Imperial Compliance, and then they made ready to depart the Davin system. Back on the Vengeful Spirit, the deadly event on the embarkation deck when the Mournival had violently pushed Remembrances and crew members out of the way 
killing several of them, had not been forgotten. The tense mood on the ship was palpable. After the many strange events that had been taking place, several remembrances had become disillusioned with the Imperial Truth. When the iterator Kirill Sindeman had attempted to decode the facial tattoos of Erebus using the Book of Lorgar, he accidentally summoned a lesser demon of chaos onto the ship that burned a large part of the Librarium and its archives. But by the power of the Emperor being channeled through the Picts recorder Euphrates Keeler, she ultimately managed to banish it back to the warp. And so many members of the crew started to believe that the Emperor was in fact a benevolent god that could protect them, and their faith slowly started to spread to the rest of the expeditionary fleet. A cult called the Lectisio Divinitatis had now been established on the flagship. Their members gathered in secret meetings, but every once in a while these would be discovered and violently broken up by the Astartes. This violence against civilians further deteriorated their trust in the War Master. But now that the Great Crusade would continue, a sense of normality returned to the fleet. Before the disrupting events on Davin, the War Master's 63rd had been en route to Sardis, on a rendezvous with a 203rd Expeditionary Fleet, led by Engron, Primarch of the World Eaters. Together, they had organized a campaign of compliance in the Chiades Cluster. But after this miraculous revival, Horus had different plans. And so, instead, both fleets made their way to a newly discovered sector called Draconis 3-11. This was a fairly large sector inhabited by the Oretian Technocracy, a peaceful and technologically advanced human civilization that spanned a dual star system. The government of their civilization was centered on their capital, Aureus. When the 63rd and 203rd expeditionary fleets arrived in the system, Horus invited the Oritian diplomatic delegation, led by fabricator consul Emory Selignac, onto his flagship to discuss their peaceful assimilation into the Imperium. The Oritian guard units, although not physically enhanced, wore armor very similar to the battle plate of the Astartes. And yet, this was the very first time they had been in contact with each other. The reason for their technological development was simple. They possessed a fairly large database of STCs, Humanity had taken these standard template constructs with them amongst the stars during the Age of Technology. Especially to the knowledge-obsessed Mechanicum, such a wealth of information was of immeasurable value. Even after the Great Crusade's centuries of conquest, it was believed the vast majority of the original database was still missing from the Imperial Archives. To find even a single new STC was a price beyond imagination. And here was a civilization that owned many intact blueprints. Mechanicum representative Regulus, a tech priest who was part of the War Master's Council, quickly brought the topic of STCs into the discussion. The Fabricator Consul did acknowledge his civilization's reliance on the old technology and confirmed his possession of many STCs that the Imperium had not yet found. Upon learning this fact, Horus immediately shot the Fabricator Consul in the face with his bolter and ordered the rest of the delegation murdered as well. The official Imperial record of their meeting would be that the Oretians had tried to assassinate the War Master. But what really happened was that Horus had simply found what he was looking for. With the existence of this many SDCs confirmed, he no longer had any need for diplomacy. Instead, he ordered them to wipe out the Oretian technocracy and discreetly secure their entire SDC database. With this invaluable price in his personal control, Horus would be able to bribe the Mechanicum and secure their allegiance to himself. With the promise of many invaluable STCs, Regulus was dispatched back to Mars to sway the Fabricator General Kalbor Hell to the War Master's side. And thus began the ten-month-long war against the Oritian technocracy. It was a hard-fought battle, but ultimately the Oritians stood no chance against the combined might of the Space Marine Legions. Even Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children, was making his way to the system to join the battle. The cooperation of the three Primarchs would be the perfect opportunity to lay the foundations for the civil war that was about to come. The long siege against the Oritian capital gave Horus time to observe his legions and figure out who would unquestionably follow their Primarch. Horus had convinced himself that his betrayal of the Emperor was out of his own free volition. His pride did not allow himself to consider his service to Chaos as anything else but his own rational and logical decision. 
but the poisonous anathema that had struck his arm on Devon's moon had left its mark, and the corrupting influence of Nurgle was increasingly influencing his way of thinking. A thousand seemingly unrelated events that had been orchestrated by the powers of the warp, and these had led Horus to align himself with the gods of chaos. Angron, the Red Angel of Butchery, as he was called, was easily convinced to join the traitor side. He had pretty much always hated most of his brother Primarchs, but at least Horus didn't despise him for his savage talents for brutality. As a former slave and gladiator, Angron considered the Emperor a tyrant that was ultimately not much different to his former slave masters on his homeworld Nuseria. The Emperor had wronged him too many times. The Butcher's nails that had been permanently embedded in his brain back in the slave pits caused him pain and anger that made it difficult for him to perceive things any different. He never cared about the ideals of the Great Crusade. He never wanted to be a Primarch, and he had already been on the knife's edge of rebellion before. The only thing that mattered to him now was battle and bloodshed. Fulgrim, the Palatine Phoenix, would be more difficult to persuade to the cause. But he was prideful, and always striving for perfection, especially in battle, and these character traits could be exploited. When his trusted apothecary Fabius made the suggestion of tinkering with his legion's physical enhancements, Fulgrim, in his quest for perfection, was seduced to authorize these heretical experimentations. Further biological augmentations, even those inspired by Xenos, could make his warriors stronger, more effective in battle, and more perfect. These experimentations would be secretly performed on those highest in command and most loyal to the Legion. On several occasions, these upgrades did in fact turn out to be rather effective and made the Emperor's children who had undergone these operations even deadlier than before. The fact that the Emperor's perfect creation of the Astartes turned out to be rather easily improved upon by Fabius led Fulgrim and his legion on the road towards disillusionment with the incomplete work of his father. In the aftermath of the Emperor's children's xenocide against a serpentine alien species called the Lair, Fulgrim had come into possession of a new and perfectly crafted sword he had found on their planet. Unbeknownst to the Primarch, this silver blade of Lair was host to a demon of Slanesh. The very Chaos God that had been brought into existence by the Eldar's unbelievably disturbing pursuit of hedonistic excess. Eventually, Fulgrim started to notice the effect the artifact had on his way of thinking, especially when he was carrying the blade, but his pride did not allow him to see the danger in such a trivial thing. He was, after all, the most perfect Primarch, destined to carve out his own fate. And so, the whispering voice coming from the sword slowly but surely began to exploit his insecurities and chip away at the Primarch's resolve. After the campaign of extermination, he received contact from an Eldar delegation under the leadership of one of their most powerful psychers, by the name of Eldred Ulthran. Through his incredible foresight, he had seen the treachery that was about to unfold, and he contacted Fulgrim in order to warn him about the plans of his brother Horus. Fulgrim agreed to meet the delegation and invited them to his own flagship, the Pride of the Emperor. However, the Primarch became enraged at the Eldar's preposterous suggestion about the supposed disloyalty of the War Master. He could not tolerate such an insult and refused to heed the warning. Encouraged by the demonic blade, Fulgrim exploded with rage and attacked the delegation. The meeting with the Xenos ended in bloodshed, but they managed to escape his flagship through teleportation. His 28th expeditionary fleet finally rendezvoused with his brother Primarchs to join the war against the Oretian technocracy. For a brief moment, Fulgrim reconsidered the words of caution the Farseer had shared with him. Had the Eldar spoken the truth, or had it just been a depraved attempt to sow division amongst the forces of the Imperium? Upon arrival, Fulgrim's ships were in a perfect position to attack and destroy the unsuspecting fleet of the War Masters, floating in orbit around Aureus. If the warning was true, perhaps it was his duty to do exactly just that. With a single order, he could have the entire flotilla, including the Vengeful Spirit, destroyed and prevent the Civil War right there and then. But the demonic sword that hung at his side tempered his suspicions. Fulgrim just couldn't believe Horus would betray the Imperium. 
And so, he instead ordered a shuttle towards Horus's flagship to personally meet with his brother and discuss everything that had happened since the event on Davin's moon. Horus told Fulgrim about the terrible visions he had seen in the warp and explained how the Emperor had exploited his sons and the entirety of mankind. As long as Fulgrim could remember, he had always strived towards perfection to become just like the Emperor himself. But after hearing these terrible truths from his own brother, all of his life's ambitions shattered before his very eyes. After several days of persuasion, manipulation, and the ever-compelling demonic voice whispering inside of his head, the disheartened Fulgrim was ultimately convinced to join Horus in his plan to overthrow the Emperor. Lorgar, a Primarch of the Wordbearers, had of course already been in service of Chaos. After the Emperor had ordered the destruction of the city Monarchia by the Ultramarines, it was his first chaplain Erebus who had suggested there might be gods more worthy of his worship. And so, many years before Horus turned traitor, Lorgar had already travelled inside the Eye of Terror, and with the help of a demon, learned about the primordial truth of the ruinous powers. He had been the very first Primarch to fall to the corruption of Chaos, and his legion's participation in the heresy was guaranteed. The warrior lodges that had taken hold in their legions had become a useful tool for manipulation. Their inherent secretive nature together with the informal organization outside the order of rank had made them the perfect place to spread the Warmaster's propaganda. Through these covert meetings, Horus's new ideas were carefully and deliberately dispersed throughout their ranks. Since it was not understood why the Emperor had returned to Terra and abandoned his legions, many Astartes could be convinced to change the priority of their allegiance towards their own Primarchs. There were in fact very few left who had fought directly by the Emperor's side during the early days of the Great Crusade. Most of them had died during the many bloody conquests, and so the Old Guard had gradually been replaced. Times were changing, and many accepted the new way of things. Those battle brothers who did not agree with this worrisome development that was taking place within their once beloved legion eventually stopped attending such meetings and became isolated. This made it easy to identify those who would never forsake their oath of loyalty to the Emperor if they could not be trusted to perform their Primarch's orders under any and all circumstances they would have to go. For the rebellion to succeed, uh, unquestionable obedience would be required and those who did not fall in line were put on a blacklist to eventually be purged from their legions. When the Istvan system rebelled against the Imperium, it presented the War Master with the perfect opportunity to carry out these plans. Crushing the uprising would provide a believable pretense under which Horus could continue to gather the legions loyal to him without garnering any suspicion. Istvan also lay in the outer reaches of the Segmentum Obscurus, far away from the prying eyes of Terra and the Emperor. The War Master's dark plans would be obscured by the Great Distance, and the Gods of Chaos could provide assistance by conjuring up convenient warp storms to hinder communications and travel between this region of space. And so, the Sons of Horus, Emperor's Children, and World Eaters set out towards Istvan, where they would be joined by Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard, the Primarch of the 14th Legion was cold, rational, and developed a deep-seated mistrust of the Emperor's tyrannic nature. From all these brothers, only Horus had earned his respect and his friendship. When the great treachery unfolded, he was impressed by how far Horus's plan had already progressed. When the time to choose allegiances finally came, he chose to be loyal to the War Master and pledged his legion to the cause. With such a great force under his command, Horus could afford to send Fulgrim and parts of his third legion to the Kalanides system to reinforce Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands. He would be sent to assist in clearing an orc infestation on Kalanides IV. The Palatine Phoenix was, however, given instructions to figure out to whom the Tenth Legion's loyalties would be if a civil war broke out. The two brothers had always shared a very close companionship. And if anyone could convince Ferris Manus to side with the War Master, it would be Fulgrim. The War Master's force got their first taste of battle against the Istvanians on one of their most outer planets called Istvan Extremis. The planet was an observation station whose powerful monitoring and communication system supported the Istvan fleet. To have any hope of striking against the capital on Istvan III, this critical link in the enemy's defenses needed to be destroyed first. 
Lord Commander Eidolon's first company of the Emperor's children and the Death Guard's seventh company under leadership of Nathaniel Garu would lead the assaults. The Astartes loaded into their Thunderhawks and made their way towards the surface. They would soon find out that the Istvanians were no pushovers, and the fighting was fierce. The rebellion of the Istvan sector had gone unnoticed for many years, and once the Imperium arrived in force to enforce compliance, the defenders had been able to muster a strong army to meet them. Their defensive network of robust Imperial origin, and since improved upon, was formidable. Although their soldiers lacked melee expertise, their ranged weapons were powerful enough to wound even Astartes. But perhaps more worrisome was that their culture had become faithful worshippers of Slanesh. Their fealty to the Prince of Pleasure had been rewarded by granting them the power of the War Singers, vocalists who through magnificent song could control the body, mind, and soul of its listeners. They used their songs to command Istvanian soldiers in battle, and their concentrated high-pitched shrieks had the power to blow open the skull of an Astartes, killing them outright. These powers were not something to be trifled with. In the battle for Istvan Extremis, the Emperor's children suffered heavy losses, but in their quest for martial perfection continued fighting on, and even pushed the Istvan defenders back. Eventually, Lord Commander Eidolon, with the help of Sol Tarvitz, managed to kill the enemy's main commanding war singer. The duel had been a close call, nearly resulting in both their deaths. But the new biological enhancements on Eidolon's vocal cords implanted by Apothecary Fabius allowed him to perform a screeching howl of deafening volume that overpowered the war singers and disabled her powers long enough for Eidolon to decapitate her. With their leader slain, the defenders had no hope of standing against the Astartes, and a battle ended with the slaughter of the remaining garrison. The Death Guard's forces had been badly bloodied too. During the fighting, their commander Nathaniel Garrow, captain of the Seventh Great Company, had lost his leg to a war singer's vocal attack. Between the many corpses on the battlefield, he lay bleeding out, and if nothing was to be done, he would soon die. He was a close companion of Sol Tarvitz. Despite being from different legions, during the many campaigns their legions had fought side by side, the two captains had become sword brothers, and inscribed each other's vam braces with oaths of friendship. In the aftermath of the battle, Tarvitz made sure Garrow would survive his horrible wounds and live to fight another day. He would be equipped with a biomechanical leg that would eventually allow him to return to combat. For the time being, Mortarion assigned him command of the Eisenstein, an Imperial frigate in the Death Guard fleet, until he fully recovered. With the resistance on Istvan Extremis out of the way, the War Master's fleet now had a clear path towards Istvan III. The enemy's capital, called the Coral City, was now in reach, and they would soon be able to deal a crippling blow to the rebels. The city's east side lay against a huge mountainous ridge, so any ground-based assault could only attack from the west side. This part of the city was however well protected by a large outer wall and trench networks that would prove difficult to breach. Unfortunately for the Istvanian defenders, Horus wasn't planning a conventional ground attack. For the next stage of the war, the War Master prepared the troops for drop pod assaults directly into the heart of the city, where it would strike at the enemy's command posts. The large city had two important locations where the rebellion's leadership could be. The most likely place was the palace, where the Emperor's children and world eaters would deploy and occupy strategic positions. The second suspected location was the large religious center called the Siren Hold the spiritual heart of the city. This labyrinth of many complex and multi-leveled structures would prove difficult to capture, so this task was assigned to the Sons of Horus to deal with. The large part of the Istvan forces held up in the trenches on the city's outskirts. The Death Guard was tasked with holding this bulk of enemy troops engaged so the rest of the Astartes had time to secure their objectives. The tenacious battle in the trenches against the numerically superior defenders would be far from glamorous, but Mortarion's rugged legion was perfectly suited to this type of fighting, and the Death Guard Primarch did not object. With the three main objectives assigned, the lesser enemy targets would be distributed amongst the remaining companies from any of the legions. Although the battle plan made tactical sense, it was strange that the selection of companies that were assigned to this daring attack diverged from usual procedures. 
Under normal conditions, the prestigious honor of a main strike against an enemy capital would go to captains of the first companies, or even to the Primarchs themselves. But this time the troops seemed to have been picked at random. Surprisingly enough, warriors like Abaddon, Aximond, Eidolon, and Karn of the World Eaters, who were usually assigned to lead such spear tips, would stay on their flagships and sit this battle out for seemingly no good reason. Sol Tarvitz had been perplexed by Eidolon's mysterious new powers, with which he had disabled the war singer on Istvan Extremis. He had never seen an Astartes do such a thing in battle before, and so requested an audience with his Lord Commander for an explanation of how such a thing was possible. Eidolon explained that the bio enhancement had been sanctioned by their Primarch Fulgrim himself. As gratitude for his assistance in killing the war singer, he offered the captain to undergo the operations as well. Worried about the heretical implications of such an experimentation, Sol Tarvitz declined the offer. Disappointed and suspicious of his refusal, Eidolon decided to assign Tarvitz to the strike force that was about to be sent down to their doom on the surface of Istvan III. Tarvitz was delighted by the opportunity to fight alongside his friends Loken and Togedon from the 16th Legion. But when he inspected the unusual list of companies appointed to the attack, he became suspicious of Eidolon's motives. Without notifying the Lord Commander, Sol Tarvitz met with Rylanor, a venerable dreadnought who served as the Ancient of Rites of the Legion. Rylanor had served with the Great Crusade since its very beginning, and held significant authority within their ranks. Tarvitz requested the honor of replacing Captain Edavokar, the previous standard bearer and liaison officer to Lord Commander Eidolon, who had been killed in the battle on Istvan Extremis. If he was assigned this new role, somebody else could take his place in the dropout assault, and he could stay on the Andronius to investigate what was going on. Initially, Rylanor seemed suspicious of his motives, but he eventually agreed to the request and made sure Tarvitz would be replaced. The ancient Dreadnought had not seen battle for quite some time, so with this opportunity he decided he would go to the surface of Istvan III himself to lead the troops in glorious combat. And so, with the Warmaster's fleet stationed in orbit above Istvan III, the drop pod assault on the Coral City would begin. Space Marines of four legions, the Sons of Horus, Emperor's Children, World Eaters, and Death Guard were ready for the attack. With hurtling speed, they were racing down towards the surface to bring death upon their enemies. The deployment on the surface mostly carried out as expected, but did not go without some setbacks. Communications back to the fleet had been disrupted, Several drop pods that rained down upon the Siren Hold landed scattered due to the complex layout of the area, but under the leadership of Garviel Loken and Terek Togedon, the Sons of Horus made their way towards their objective nonetheless. The religious population of the city roused in a fury by their war singers rose up against the invaders, but the hordes of frenzied civilians were bloodily massacred in the streets by the World Eaters. The Death Guard were busy methodically clearing out the trench network. They had been given support in the form of an Imperator-class titan called the Dies Irae, who was wreaking havoc outside the city walls. Meanwhile, the Emperor's children had already successfully infiltrated the palace. Before long, Captain Lucius of the 13th Company, one of the Emperor's children's most gifted sword masters, had already killed the rebelling Istvan governor in a duel. With their leader slain, the city would soon fall to the onslaught. But what the Astartes assigned to Istvan III's invasion did not realize was that they had been sent to their deaths themselves. What had seemed like randomly selected companies had in fact been the Primarchs' careful selection of those who could not be relied upon to follow their legion in the coming civil war against the Emperor. Far above them in orbit, the Warmaster's fleet was preparing to deliver a deadly bombardment to obliterate everyone on the planet, Istvanians and Astartes alike. To prevent a potential word of warning reaching the troops below, all communications with the assault units had been cut off. But when the ships maneuvered into lower orbit to be able to fire their payloads, Sol Tarvitz, who had remained on his ship, the Andronius, came to inspect the gun decks and discovered the horrible plot. The gun crews were loading the cannons with virus bombs. Each warhead would unleash the Life Eater virus, a rampant organism that destroyed life in all its forms and wiped out every shred of organic matter on the surface of a planet within hours. Even Astartes in power armor would not be able to survive it. Only the Warmaster himself had the authority to deploy such devastating weapons. Horrified by his discovery, 
Tarvitz rushed towards the embarkation deck, where he stole a Thunderhawk to make his way towards Istvan III, and warn his battle brothers of the horrible betrayal. The unauthorized Thunderhawk that was racing towards the surface was soon discovered. When the requests to turn around were denied, several fighter craft were sent in pursuit to take it down. Captain Tarvitz had not been trained as a pilot and his flying skills were lacking. The relatively slow and lumbering transport craft he was steering now did little to improve his chances of survival. Despite his best efforts to evade the pursuing fighters, he would likely be shot down any moment now. The Thunderhawk was passing through the engagement zone of the Eisenstein. The unexpected chase had caught their attention and so they attempted to communicate with the Thunderhawk to clarify the situation. To his incredible luck, Sol Tarvitz was connected directly through to his honored battle brother Nathaniel Garrow, who was commanding the frigate. Tarvitz explained that Horus had betrayed the legions and was planning to virus bomb the planet. But with no time to explain everything, the shocked Nathaniel Garrow would just have to trust him. The Death Guard captain had only two choices. Either he would have to forsake his oaths of brotherhood and friendship and leave Tarvitz to be blown up in the void, or he would have to defy the War Master. Several missiles launched from the Eisenstein's gun decks and trailed behind the gunships. To Tarvitz's great relief, they struck the pursuing fighters. He was saved. For now, Garrow would report back and lie to Lord Commander Eidolon on the Andronius that he had shot down the stolen Thunderhawk. The explosions would mask the fact that he had actually let Sol Tarvitz escape towards Istvan III. The Eisenstein would soon have problems of its own, however, as the commander would eventually find out what had really taken place. And so, with the limited time he had left, Garrow made plans to get away from the fleet and travel towards Terra to inform the Emperor of Horus's betrayal. Sol Tarvitz crash-landed his Thunderhawk in the palace, and he immediately warned the Emperor's children to seek cover in face of the incoming bombardment. Captain Lucius, ambitious and loyal to his Primarch, could not believe Fulgrim had sent him to the surface to be killed. But it was his friendship with Sol Tarvitz that had gotten his name on Eidolon's list, which had doomed him to die with the rest. They quickly warned the blood-covered World Eaters as well. They had just finished massacring the mobs of civilians in the plaza, and now they all made their way towards shelter beneath the palace. The units of Emperor's Children and Death Guard were contacted over the Voxnet to find cover. Overhead, they could already see the first streaks of an orbital bombardment coming in. And so, as swiftly as they could, Loken and Torgeddon led their troops deep into the catacombs of the Siren Hold where they might have a chance of survival. Most of the Death Guard were about to be caught outside the walls in the open, however. The only shelter they had available to them were the small bunkers and dungouts of the trench network. The Imperator-class Titan Dies Irae had already been given orders from the fleet above to close all vents and seal itself from the outside air completely. Its weapons shut down and all hatches were airlocked waiting for the impending bombardment. From the command deck of the Titan, they could see the space marines of the Death Guard below now desperately running for cover whenever it could be found. The Istvanians had clearly not received any such orders. Emboldened by what they perceived to be the Astartes retreating and the seemingly disabled Titan, they moved out in the open to launch an attack on the invaders. That is when the first virus bombs exploded high above the Coral City. The huge explosions spread their deadly payloads far and wide into the atmosphere. Designed to kill every living thing on the surface of a planet, the viral strains released on Istvan III were the most efficient killers in the War Master's arsenal. The bombs were set to burst at numerous different altitudes and locations across the planet. It rolled out over the planet, devouring every possible form of biomass it came in contact with. Within moments, the Coral City was enveloped, and everyone still caught on the outside was about to die in the most horrible way imaginable. The virus penetrated their armor and worked its way into their skins. There was no way back. It entered their bloodstreams and started eating them from the inside out. As their bones and muscles disintegrated, warriors fell to their knees. Even Astartes screamed out in agony as the virus broke down the cellular bonds of their flesh at the molecular level. Its many victims suffered unimaginable horror as they literally dissolved into a soup of rancid meat within minutes of exposure. Leaving little but sloshing heaps of rotted armor, thousands of Astartes and billions of civilians all over Istvan III suffered the same horrific fate. 
Of all ground troops caught in the open, only ancient Rylanor, clad in his dreadnought sealed sarcophagus, managed to withstand the swarm of death. He witnessed the troops he had led into battle decompose before his very eyes, and he swore a personal oath of revenge against the Primarch that had forsaken his beloved legion. Meanwhile, the remembrances of the vengeful spirit had been summoned by the War Master to gather and witness the Battle of Istvan. They had often requested to be able to witness the realities of war, so they could accurately depict the battles of the Great Crusade. Now Horus would grant these pesky remembrances their wishes and showed them what war really meant. He had locked them into a large gathering chamber on his flagship, and on large screens displayed the virus bombing of Istvan III taking place. Having made his point very clearly, the War Master then ordered his Astartes to open fire upon the shocked crowd of remembrances to kill all of them. Euphrates Keeler, Kirill Sinderman, and Mercedes Oleton managed to escape the massacre through the help of one of the few remaining loyalist Astartes, aboard the Vengeful Spirit, an ancient Astartes by the name of Yakton Cruz. The old warrior remembered what it had been like to fight alongside the Emperor before the Legion had been assigned to Horus, and through the Legion's troublesome changes, had always clung to the old ways. Before the drop pod assault, he had promised Loken to keep these remembrances safe, and so he escorted them to a Thunderhawk gunship, and together they escaped the bloodbath on the vengeful spirit. The Imperial Saint Euphrates Keeler had seen visions of Nathaniel Garrow's defiance against the War Master. And so the remembrances in the old Astartes made their way towards the Eisenstein to join the breakout from the fleet. On the surface of Istvan III, the Life Eater virus had finally burned itself out. With no more organic matter to devour, the virulent plague ultimately consumed itself and faded out. But it wouldn't be completely over yet. After a virus bombing, the atmosphere would be filled to the brim with decomposing gases from billions of tons of churned up biomass. Horus's retribution wasn't done yet, and with a lance battery salvo from the vengeful spirit, ignited the skies of Istvan III into a raging inferno. Even the mighty Dies Irae, despite its preparations, had a difficult time withstanding the blazing firestorm that now consumed the planet. Its mechanical stabilizer gyros barely managed to keep the massive Imperator class Titan upright in the gusts of hot air. The staggering temperature outside was almost burning through the protective heat shields. The crew inside did not know if it could hold out much longer. But after what seemed like hours, even the firestorm would fade out. The spires of the Coral City had melted into ruins, and everywhere the world had been turned into a charred wasteland with no signs of life. It seemed a miracle that anyone would be able to live through the apocalypse that had been wrought upon Istvan III. But thanks to Sol Tarvid's heroic warning, several hundred loyalist space marines now crawled out of the rubble their mere survival a statement of defiance against the War Master's betrayal. Garviel Loken and Tarek Torgeddon and their troops would no longer be sons of Horus, but called themselves Lunar Wolves once again. To everyone's surprise, even several squads of the Death Guard who had been deployed outside the city walls had survived the bombardment. They had burrowed themselves like rats into the trench bunkers and weathered the storm with the dogged perseverance their legion was known for. Now the survivors of the four legions gathered in the palace for their final stand. This enraged Angron so much that he organized a strike force against the loyalists under his personal command. Without consulting Horus, his gunships were already making their way towards the surface. The furious Primarch of the World Eaters would not let anyone stop him, until those who had the impudence to stand against him were all slaughtered. Angron's impatient action had not at all been according to Horus's plan, Instead, he had wished to completely destroy the Coral City in a final bombardment, but with his brother fighting on the surface, that was no option anymore. But so characteristically for the War Master, he would always find a way to turn a setback into an opportunity. What better way to push his legions to the point of no return than a bitter fight of brother against brother? It would be a good way to truly cement the loyalty of those who followed him, and fuel their hatred for the lackeys of the Emperor. After all, how long could this ragtag band of survivors really hope to resist? 
And so, for the first time since the Great Crusade had begun so many years ago, Astartes would be fighting Astartes in full force. The traitor forces, personally led by Angron and Eidolon, conducted many raids against the remaining loyalist holdout on Istvan III. Even Mortarion joined the Titan, as they scoured the trenches to finish off any remnants of Death Guard units still caught outside the walls. But the defenders turned out to be more organized than the traitors had anticipated. For weeks, each raid against the palace was humiliatingly pushed back. Under command of Sol Tarvitz, the four legions stood as one. They hunkered down in the ruins of the palace, ready to kill their former brothers. Despite their best efforts to break through the defenses, each raid cost the traders a high death toll for very little gain. Meanwhile, Fulgrim had returned to the fleet with bad news. Ferris Manus could not be persuaded to join them. The diplomacy ended in bloodshed, and Fulgrim's forces severely crippled the Iron Hand's fleets with a surprise attack, but the Palatine Phoenix could not bring himself to destroy his brother completely. This setback disrupted Horus's plan. Without the Iron Hand's allegiance, they might not have enough warriors to fight the Loyalist legions that would soon be coming their way. Fulgrim should have killed Ferris Manus, and leaving him alive was a grave mistake that would cost them dearly. Fortunately, the word of their betrayal had not yet been able to reach the rest of the Imperium. The Imperial Fists had recently been ordered back to Terra to reinforce the Throne World. The Space Wolves were sent on an errand to arrest Magnus the Red and Prospero for his continued use of magic, as he accidentally disrupted the Emperor's Webway project in his failed attempt to use the warp to warn him about Horus's betrayal. The other Loyalist legions the War Master sent out a careful selection of orders that would strategically scatter their forces and make it difficult for them to rendezvous. The Ultramarines, Blood Angels, White Scars, and Dark Angels were all dispatched on distant campaigns in the furthest outreaches of the Imperium, so they would not be able to react quickly. The Iron Hands had been bloodied by Fulgrim, the Raven Guard and Salamanders were relatively small legions that could be dealt with. The loyalties of the remaining legions were still uncertain, but the War Master was confident he could still turn them. But the survivors on Istvan III needed to be dealt with swiftly, so he could prepare his forces for the next stage of the war. But the Lunar Wolves, under the leadership of Garvio Loken and Tarek Torgeddon, were still fiercely resisting. Every moment they were able to delay the War Master would be time for the Imperium to respond. If they were to die on Istvan III, they were determined to take as many traitors with them as they could. The only ones Horus could truly trust to deal with this mess were his trusted mournable. And so he sent Ezekiel Abaddon and little Horus Axanon to the surface to kill their former Oath brothers. Just in case, he also ordered the Dies Irae to breach the walls of the city and march on the palace. But the lumbering titan would need time to arrive. Fortunately for the traitors, the self-obsessed Captain Lucius of the Emperor's Children, who was fighting in the ruins alongside the Loyalists, was growing weary of standing in the shadow of Sol Tarvit. Despite the bitter affair, initially the Swordmaster had frankly reveled in the martial challenge the battle presented him. He had challenged many traitor champions in duels and defeated every single one of them. But in the end, there was little glory to be won amongst these ruins and he resented his friendship with Tarvitz that got him into this mess in the first place. He desperately longed for the magnificence of fighting alongside his own Primarch Fulgrim once more, and so in secret he had arranged a meeting with Eidolon where he promised to betray the Loyalists if he was allowed to return to his place in the Legion. And so it was that with the help of Lucius, the Emperor's children started to make progress into the Defender's flank. The arrogant Lucius sought out a duel with Tarvitz. The Blade Master's skill could not be matched and was easily winning the encounter, but Lucius hadn't realized he had walked straight into a trap set for him, and narrowly managed to escape with his life. But the damage had already been done. With their flank overrun, the resistance inside the ruins of the palace would not hold for long. Loken and Torgeddon received the news that the Mournival had come to the surface. If they would be able to kill Abaddon and Aximond, that would be a severe blow to Horus's inner circle. With a choice between joining the crumbling resistance or one last opportunity to hurt the War Master, the choice was easily made. And so in a final act of defiance, they sought out a duel for themselves. In the ruins of the city, the Mournivals searched each other out and came to blows. In brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, Torgeddon fought Aximond and Loken battled the Terminator-clad Abaddon. But the clash did not go well for the Loyalists. Aximond got the upper hand in the fighting and managed to behead Torgeddon. Enraged by the loss of his brother, Loken was pushed to great feats of strength and managed to hold his own against the mighty Abaddon. 
but the Terminator armor ultimately proved too powerful, and Loken was brought down by a crippling fist strike that crushed his chest. Abaddon took the sword Aximond had used to kill Tarek, and was about to execute Loken in the same manner as well. But before the final blow could be dealt, the Imperator Titan marched over the ruins they were fighting in. The already damaged building collapsed on top of the Mournival, burying them in the rubble. It was only due to the immense strength of the Terminator armor that it allowed Abaddon and Aximon to crawl out of there and save themselves. But their job was done. They had killed Tarek and Loken, and signaled the War Master of their victory. The last remnants of the resistant defenses started to crumble, as now tanks and rhinos rolled into their flank. The Dies Irae joined the conflict and bombarded whatever remained of the palace. The dust and smoke of the battle made it difficult to distinguish traitor from loyalist, and both sides suffered horrific losses in this most savage stage of the fighting. Horus had enough of it. The battle had become too chaotic and these losses were not worth the price. He had tolerated Angron's petty rage and Eidolon's failures long enough, and he would need these warriors for the battles that were about to come. It took all his authority to order the legions to withdraw from combat and return to their fleet. Even Angron, furious about the humiliating retreat, eventually grudgingly obeyed. If any loyalists remained on Istvan III, the War Master would finish them off with a final bombardment that would wipe the city off the face of the planet. And so, he ordered the entire fleet to rain down a huge cannonade on what little remained of the Coral City. It was the final epitaph that would leave no one in any doubt as to who had won. As Sol Tarvitz and the few remaining loyalist Astartes looked up at the skies, they knew their doom had finally come. As the explosions raged around them, they knew they had remained loyal to the Emperor right to the very end.